Welcome back to Veste Origins. Today we are talking to Jacob Umaga, who is a professional rugby player currently playing for Italian side Benetton. He's also represented England at youth level and has an appearance for the full squad as well. Jacob runs a streetwear line called Composure Club, which we are delighted to say is live on a best day right now. And we have some links to his collection in the description below. So let's get straight into it. I was on TikTok the other day, right? And I saw this video and it was what each rugby position says about you. And I'm quite interested to see your perspective on it from a guy that's actually there in the locker room. So, mm. so what I thought would be quite fun is if we go one by one through the, the positions and, and using yeah. some of your experience and say to me what it's like. So what's the typical prop? What's the typical prop? So, uh, I, I feel like props are like part of a cult. They're, they're all very <laughs> similar. They're all very strange people. You, you probably, you might get one or two outliers, um, but majority are very strange then. And they kind of spend their whole life perfecting how to just push really heavy things um they're, they're very strange people i will say that oh my god right so going from props they're strange people what about hookers because surely they're even more they're even more insane <sighs> so hookers are just failed backs they're people that <laughs> wanted to play in the backs and just can't they just put on too much weight or they just didn't grow enough and they've ended up in the front row. That's that's why. <laughs> oh God, I um I started my career as a as a hooker. Did you? Yeah, I did. Um, when I was in my phase of being an incredibly fat young kid, uh, <laughs> before I grew, so I had that phase. Uh, and yeah, I hated I hated that position. No one, I don't really think yeah. anyone truly wants to be in the pack. Would you say that, mate? Nah, definitely not. And the hookers are always moaning. They're always moaning. Like, oh, I've got to do this because. And they're always quite small as well. They're always smaller compared to the props. And I do feel for them because they're they're stuck right in the middle of it. But, you know, they've got themselves into that position. Do you have some characters on the team right now that are in the front row? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we do, actually. One of the, one of the, one of the props here at Benetton is one of the strangest guys I've, I've ever met in my life. Uh, <laughs> Where's he from? Is he, he, is he English? No, no, no. Um, I'm not actually sure where he's from, but he doesn't speak very good English. Um, and I think people struggle to communicate with him in Italian as well. <laughs> so it's just, I, I don't know how he speaks to anyone, but he, yeah. He's, and some of the lads we've had in the past at Wasps, they were weird, weird people. <laughs> can, can they read and write? <laughs> 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 right, so going on to the second row. Again, usually the tallest guy on the team. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Big friendly giants usually. Um, I always get on with second row too fast. I don't want to, to, to slate them too much. They're, it just seems like everything's going in slow motion for them when they speak, when they think. It's just everything's drawn out by two or three seconds longer than it should be. Again, I've played second row. <laughs> and that was, that was, yeah, yeah. I basically, my rugby career, I started... Uh, as a hooker and then worked my way back until I could get as far away from the pack as I possibly could. <laughs> that was the way I did it. How did you go from hooker to second row? So, there's, so, there's a big height difference. So so I'll explain it. So uh, hooker was when I was probably about 10. So we're, go yeah. we're going quite far back now, right? So 10, I was fat. I hadn't grown at all. Uh, I had only just picked up rugby. So, because uh, I, I went from a state school into a private school, didn't really know how to play rugby at all. So, the guys were just like, basically, he's a short, fat kid. Let's just fucking chuck him in the front row and hope he doesn't have to pass. Basically, I think was the, was the, was the answer yeah. there. And then, like, uh, 11 or 12 had a massive growth spurt. Then they were like, oh, you know, he's still a bit chubby. Let's chuck him in the second row, right? So ended up going there, had to buy the scrum cap, you know, ended up thinking I knew how to pass. And I was like, guys, I, I, like I'm, I know what I'm doing here. I can actually pass now. <laughs> and then just skip the back row, fuck knows how. And then they realized that I played football on the weekends and they were just like, right, you, you can play football. You're a fly off now. So I <laughs> st played at fly off for a while. <laughs> uh, could kick the furthest in the team and then basically said, no, I actually, where the glory is, is in the centres. So I was like, actually, I want to be a centre. And then also you don't have to, you don't have to tackle as much. In the, <laughs> no, not as much. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I ended up there. So yeah, mate, that, you know, and we're talking probably the worst level of rugby you can possibly imagine. <laughs> so, so. Nah, don't put yourself down like that. <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, let's not let's not profess that I was uh, you know England juniors. It was uh, very much <laughs> school rugby. Um, but yeah, there you go. Now you know my now, now you know my very um, decorated career. <laughs> that was short and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> right so let's go let's go back now let's go into flankers i i knew a few absolutely wild flankers that basically just went yeah. into a tackle for a bit of um for, for laugh really they're a bit sadists yeah i'd agree with that they're pretty loose they're just a couple of screws loose up top they'll fly into anything uh and gym junkies as well they're usually like genetic freaks as well um they just absolutely love the gym. Um, but like you said, they'll just throw their heads into anything. And I, I don't know how they do it. Would you say they're usually the strongest in the gym or are they just the ones that get in the gym the most? I'd probably say get in the gym the most, uh, but that wouldn't be the strongest. Usually like your, your props and your hookers would be your strongest. Yeah, yeah. I mean, overcompensating for the, the cardio, basically, is what we're saying. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Right, and then number eight. I think I think this is a bit of a glory position. I, I always remember when I was playing with the boys, it was always the one of the better players played number eight, and he wanted to sort of go, "I'm number eight. I'm the best in the pack. I know what I'm doing." Yeah, no, it's usually the kid that's was biggest it's like when they were younger, and they've just they're just good at running real quick, and they would just put them at the back of the scrum, let him pick it up, and just run off. Uh, yeah, and I, the glory position probably suits that up. Yeah, right now. Uh, this is a bit of a banter position, I think. Scrum half, shortest guy on the shortest guy on the team usually. Usually <laughs> the one with the biggest mouth, I'd say. Yeah, yeah, like a little yappy dog, something <laughs> like that. <laughs> chirping up. I don't blame him. I don't blame him. To be fair, um, but yeah, usually a little chirpy, chirpy guy, pretty tight with their wallet as well on a night out. <laughs> <laughs> big drinkers? Are they big drinkers? The, the scrum halves. Nah, nah, it's usually a VK's, the Scorpido and VK's. Um, and yeah, I lived with the Scrum Half and I don't think he brought me around in two years, actually. <laughs> you have to have a good relationship with the Scrum Half, right? In your position. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah to be fair, a, a majority of them, we've always gone pretty well. Um, we were pretty close. When you when you travel, right, do you do you share rooms? Yeah. Um, so back at Wasp, we used to used to be positioned. So if you're centre, you'd stay together. Nine and ten usually stay together. Uh, together. COVID hit and it was quite nice because we all got single rooms, yeah. which was like a night before a game, having your own room, like usually a double bed as well was, was ideal. Yeah. Um, but now since I've come here to Italy, they usually just, they just put the foreign people together. So if there's like eight foreigners, they'll just split two, 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 keep the Italian guys together. Um, purely just because of the language barrier. I always, there's always some real, real comedy stories of rugby players staying together in the rooms. I've heard a few interviews of people that some of the shit they get up to is absolute carnage. You'll have to tell us a few stories about that one day. I don't think I've got any actually. Really? All the guys I was in the room with were just pretty chilled out to be fair. Because if it was at Wasp, I'd usually be with Paolo. Yes, who, um, yes. It would just be pretty chilled out together to be fair. What position does Paolo play? He is a centre, centre or winger. Okay, got it, got it. He looks a bit of a beast. I wouldn't want to be on the other side of the tackle <laughs> yeah. from him, to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's strong. <laughs> <laughs> right. Now we're getting into uh, the, the champagne positions. So, yes. so, right. Give me some, give me some background on fly half. First of all, first of all, give me some background on like how you ended up playing in fly half. Uh, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, when I was young, I was the only one that could kick, really. Could only kick and pass quite well off both uh, pass off both hands kick off both feet yeah. um, so just you just kind of ended up there because usually you'd have your, your quicker guys outside so just like right you just stand there try and get the ball out to them and then I didn't really grow much so I just kind of stayed stayed in that same position really yeah yeah got it right so some of the some of the I did some research here and I watched some watched some content about what people were saying about fly halves right and I don't think it I, don't, I actually don't think it's very nice <laughs> <laughs> they basically say that you're that a fly half is usually the biggest not should we say lightweight on the team they usually <laughs> they're usually the glory they're usually the glory guy they like to get the points they don't necessarily like putting in the hard work to get there um what do you have to say for that? <laughs> what do you have to say for yourself? I'd agree, to be honest. <laughs> I, can't, I, I can't. Like, in a, in a position, where, like, in a team where you've probably got 13, you know, bar the 9 and 10, everyone else is pretty much freak athletes. We're just there as the brains, really. Kind of like your quarterback. You just kind of sit there, sit back in our, in our dinner suit, try and stay clean as possible. <laughs> um, and I, I would agree completely with that. 
How would you how would you feel? Because uh, I remember this obviously playing the very different level, but um, I remember my some of my centres and even wingers back in the day would go, "Oh, I'd like to I'd like to kick off the ground, Josh today," and I and I'd sort of go, "Fuck off." <laughs> <laughs> have you had a bit of that before of people sort of gone oh yeah no I'd, I'd like to have a go today 100% 100% and you get a lot in training people come up and I've just done like 10 kicks all right let's have a let's have a challenge screw from the touchline and then they'll, they'll take one they'll get it over and they're like yep that's why I should kick I'm like go on then in front of 50, in front of 20,000 people with the you, now you go now try it that's everything yeah um, they, they just bottle it straight away. Is there is there kicking competi- competitions in training? Like, does that go on? Like, do, do you set it up and then some boys try and come and compete? Yeah, especially here, I found that after every session, there'll be three or four guys hanging around. So they'll be like, right, where, where are we kicking from? Um, and to be fair, a lot of them here have got good boots on them. Um, they kick quite well. So it's always quite a good competition. Yeah, Go, going back, going to boots. I've heard, I've heard the fly halves are usually wearing the loudest boots. Is that true? <laughs> Fly halves or wingers, yeah. Bright white, uh, bright white boots. Usually. Bright white, that's horrendous. Mm, I would have got, got pelters if I'd worn bright white boots. Were you black and white boots? You, ha- you have to with the, with the metal studs. Like If I'd worn anything else, I would have just got absolute shit ripped out of me. Yeah, we had a point at Le- I was at Leicester in the academy and we could only wear black boots for like two years. Um, and it absolutely broke me. <laughs> so as soon as I found, found out I was leaving, I brought the brightest pair of orange boots <laughs> nice i'd wear them every training session until i left do you do you wear like uh like conventional rugby boots because I, I know that's a bit of a, a, a sort of um a conversation point because i know a lot of fly halves are now going into like more football style boots right um I, I just wear mizuno's like top top range one i think that quite a few footballers wear them as well yeah. they're called like the made in japan ones yeah um, then they're, they're not like the they've got a mix between studs and molds underneath uh, the sole plate and they're, they're pretty light as well and I think I've seen a few footballers wear them as well yeah do you do you because for me when we I was kicking it was always between like getting a thicker boot to sort of feel like I'm getting generated power and then worried about like the thinness in terms of speed are you like do you worry about that or is it just like look I back my I back my um, you know my kick in I don't need to worry about that <laughs> I've had that before, definitely. Yeah. Like I used to wear Tiempos quite a lot because they were a bit heavier, so you could, like you say, feel when you're kicking. Yeah. And then I've worn like Pumas before that are very thin and they've hurt my feet. But now with Mizuno's, they're like the comfiest boot. Yeah. So like, I, I, I don't worry about like the kicking side of it because I know that my, I'm, I'm pretty comfy in it. Right, so let's go to centres. Give me some... What, what's the crack with centres? What are they like? <laughs> bit... There's just two types. There's either the pretty boy centers, you know, love love the gym, always doing arms, you know, got <laughs> the hair's always nicely done. Or there's the old school centers, which just, you know, keep quiet. They're not, they always wear black boots. They're always pretty <laughs> chilled out. And they don't train, they don't train until probably Thursday or Friday because they, they don't need to do too much. Wingers, what are wingers like? Sim- kind of similar to us. They're pretty, pretty, pretty boy style players. Usually, Wax their legs, wear the shortest shorts, fake tan, try and look as good as po- try and look as good as possible because these are the guys finishing off the tries. Um, but they're just freak athletes, especially nowadays, absolute freak athletes. And then the last one, I, on the video that I saw, they were saying with the fullbacks, they were saying they are the lifesavers of the team, and actually you really do need them. So a lot of the boys just don't really give them a lot. of banter because you kind of you kind of rely on the fullback would you agree yeah i'd agree with that actually you put your your whole team's life in their hands pretty much and they they usually front up and i kind of got a lot of respect for playing fullback recently i got a lot of respect for out and out fullbacks because you have to be like obviously it's like the goalkeeper in football you're there to to stop the last ditch uh tries and a lot of them do you know, very, very good jobs with that. Have you ever moved around? Like when you're in the academies, were you, did you play other positions? Or was it always fly half? I've played everywhere in the backs. To be fair, um, I started as a fly half, moved to inside centre, played a little bit of outside centre in the academy at Leicester. Um, went to New Zealand, played fullback for like a year. Came back here uh, to England, so I played another year at fullback. Um, the only thing I haven't played is is wing. I think in like in a proper game, I played scrum half for 
like 10 minutes once. <laughs> um, that was enough. That, that was it. That was, I couldn't do it. <laughs> do you want to go on to initiations? When Jake and I were at uni, we had a few initiations. Jake has actually been through one. I actually, I actually refused to do it. <laughs> Um, but we played in the in the uni football team, and and it was pretty horrendous. Do you want to do you want to summarise it? It's probably quickly. quite tame compared to anything you're going to tell us in a minute. <laughs> but um, in you know, an effort to make myself sound like a big man, I'll try and embellish it a little bit. But yeah, it was just um, when we joined the football team. Naturally, first year of university. Yeah, they called us along to some strange, dirty little house, didn't they? On um, I think it was a Thursday night and asked us to each bring a bottle of wine with us. I thought, oh, that's very nice. You know, civilised, we'll take a bottle of wine with us. Um, you know, obviously being a student as well, you buy the cheapest one. So I think I picked up about a £3.10 bottle of red wine. <laughs> Little did I know that as soon as you turned up, you would be instructed to, to down you know, down that bottle of wine. So that's obviously a great start. So I can't, I don't think that stayed in me for a particularly long time as well. Um, what else did we do that night? I think we had challenges involving going around the streets and collecting items of lingerie from men and women. I think um, one of the boys may have been given some animal food to eat as well. Um, and that Thankfully, is as much as my memory can piece together. I think basically you ended up you basically ended up in a club wearing some of the lingerie oh, we're and wearing also bin bags. and and also print not really much else. I remember Tom coming into the club basically not in wearing, a bin bag. Very, yeah, but but that bin bag was very quickly ripped. <laughs> so yeah, that was that was a pretty horrendous one. yeah it was do you know what compared to some of the stuff we used to hear about as well it was it was relatively tame but it was enough for me as a you know strapping 18 year old <laughs> so, so go on then mate give give us some give us a background were there were there some back in the day where you're like that that was that was a fun one uh so yeah leicester um they, they've, they've been banned now uh, but they used to before us uh they were really bad initiations going on um the kind of I've heard some of the uni rugby ones and those ones are probably the worst ones I've heard, but ours aren't too as bad as that. Um, but the year uh, we got initiated into the academy, it kind of brought us all in, like stripped us off just into our, um, into our boxes and we all sat on the floor like in like this uh, dark corridor, uh, either, like shouting to keep your heads down, kind of felt like a hostage situation. And they'd call us in one by one. Uh, and there'd be like a room of 40 lads of like years and two years older than you. Um, I think my initiation, I had to do the hacker naked uh, in front of 40 lads whilst getting whipped by a towel that had tape around the end of it. So uh, electrical tape. Uh, so they were just whipping me as I was doing it. And then to finish it, I think I had to down like a, a pint glass of piss. Jeez. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't want to know. Um, so it wasn't yours. <laughs> it, it wasn't mine. It was. It was. It was horrible. It was I, absolutely I don't know horrible. if that would make it any better if you knew it was yours. <laughs> um, there was these. There was these two twins we had, uh, and they made them do a boat race of piss. They were like, "Loser has to do another piss, uh, another thing of piss," and then they both did it. And then I think I think it was like a tie, so they both had to do it again. A just, tie. There was just a lot of <laughs> urine in glasses. There was a lot of urine around in, the, in that. Were there older academy lads that were running the initiation? Is that how it worked? Yeah. So uh, in the academy, you had like your under 16s, under 17s, and we'd train with the under 18s as well. So you'd have the under 18s, the older, the older people that you look up to. They would run it. Um, so when when we went up in age group, we ended up helping out. Um, but they they were some scary because they're like full-on adult grown men playing men's rugby and we were like i think i was like just just turned 16 at the time this is a very very scary place to be yeah they are quite they are very intimidating when you turn up especially because there's the kind of authority figures of these older. yeah you passed it on right like you you did it for the the, the next round of 16 year olds so you know you gave it back yeah i i tried not to take part as much as some other people but some of the lads i think you who probably had it worse than i did were right in there i think I think the year we did, we put pillowcases over their heads. Not me personally, but like some of the lads are grabbing pillowcases. Uh, we, I think we sh- shaved someone's head. Um, 
called someone I can't remember they weren't they weren't as good as the the ones we had before because and then after that they got cancelled because I think someone someone took it too far maybe and, and they had to cancel it that's what's going on more and more is that people are taking it a little bit too far when it started off being a bit of a bit of a laugh uh, and a bit of a bonding session now it's turned into a bit more torturous it went really far didn't it and one there was in the papers about like some sexual abuse had actually gone on at one of these initiations as well so yeah oh, you right see right. like what's really interesting from like a psychological perspective you see some of the guys become really sadistic about it and really want to almost like inflict pain and torture on people Absolutely. as soon as they're given like a little bit of power yeah. so you know when i did it for the following years i wanted to you know inflict a bit of fun on them but equally i wanted people to come away having had a really like fun evening i didn't want anyone to leave like crying about it no it's yeah absolutely it's got to be about team bonding hasn't it like it, it should be more about sort of bringing like breaking down the boundaries like that's why a lot of the football clubs they get people up and they sing a song they do a karaoke in front of everyone yeah and that's that's great because it embarrasses you you then have some bonding because your teammates are then around you they help you with the embarrassment like and, and it's just something that everyone has to do and that's very different from fucking drinking your piss yeah isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, very, very different. <laughs> so when you when you then went into the uh, professional game, was it like obviously you know obviously if you have to be careful, you have to be careful. But were there, were there you know similar initiations or like did you did you just join the club and and crack on? Uh, yeah, I think I might have had to sing a song. That that was it. Um, I think Wasp Wasp weren't big on uh, the big big initiation. I know some. I think it might be Gloucester maybe that you have to drink. Is it three pints of milk? No, four pints of milk in two min in a, a minute or something. And if you don't do it, oh, and then and everyone who gets like initiated, and you all shave your head as well, which that would rattle me the most. But the professional ones aren't as bad as the as the ones that we used to do at the academy. Yeah, there's. Do you know what? I would be a bit like that as well about shaving my head. I I, yeah. I always that was one of the things where about the initiation. I was like. Oh. God, please don't touch it. Because Tom, yeah. did Tom get an eyebrow slit? Yeah, he got that? eyebrows oh, taken, mate. which is, you'd take that. <laughs> he had lovely long curly yeah, I was hair. Over your head shape. Yeah. Yeah, I was the same. I was the same when I was young. I had long, long hair. And I was like, I've grown this for four years. I don't want to cut it off for the sake of this. Yeah, it's not worth it. It's, it's literally <laughs> not worth it. But to be fair, would you rather shave your head or have one eyebrow? One eyebrow. Yeah, one eyebrow. Easily. <laughs> <laughs> but then, but then, would you leave the one eyebrow, or would you shave the other one up so you got some <laughs> symmetry? Nah, you, you got to leave oh. it. Have you seen people with no eyebrows? Yeah, leave it. They they can't offer any kind of expression. It's really <laughs> hard to interpret their faces. <laughs> it's really difficult. You end up looking yeah. like Matt Smith. Like exactly. Seven, bless him. He's lost the eyebrows. Oh, wonderful. Well, yeah, that's cleared up initiations. God, that's quite haunting to think back to those. To be honest with you, so um, yeah, let's move on mm. nicely. So question i had then is how much time do rugby players actually spend in the gym then because there's kind of this conception that they're in the gym all day every day versus on the playing fields and i'd love you to shine some light on it so uh like a normal day you probably only be in for about an hour an hour 15 max um and we'd only gym maybe so we play like a saturday to a saturday you'd only gym three days maybe four if you wanted to go in for an extra session but i think like in off season, I, I would probably gym longer in the day. I like go for two hours or something. We only gym for about an hour Got and it. a bit. That's about it, really. Got it. And are you given a plan that you're meant to fulfil and like lifts that you're meant to prioritise, or is it very much up to you? Yeah, so we get plans from our S and C coaches, um, and it's pretty much just your main compound lifts, and then a, f a few accessory stuff after that. It's not. It is a bit different to like normal, like everyday day to day gym because obviously you're trying to prepare for a game, yeah. but it's still pretty similar. Got it. And are you, you're, all your lifts like measured as well, like your progress tracked on them? Yeah. So every kind of, I think it was six weeks, two months, maybe we do like a, a test to see how you're doing, like a one rep or a two rep. And then they work percentages back from that, like for the next kind of four or five weeks. Got it. And is there a kind of like a trade-off between like balancing your like strength and weight, whereas like a bodybuilder might just be trying to put on size? Are you trying to make sure you don't put on too much size? It probably depends on the position, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. It depends on the position. Uh, and I think a lot of lads, when we have pre-season, we have no games for like two months, three months. Everyone tries to, you know, sort themselves out there physically. And then it's just kind of trying to maintain throughout the season because if you're playing week to week you know you're going to get sore 
shoulders we saw back or we saw so you just kind of then maintain until you get another break to then try and go harder again i would think that the um the strength conditioning coaches would be like super anti one rep maxes does that still go does that still go down like do people still do that obviously within a test environment but still yeah we've done it here uh, in italy at benetton uh we didn't do, we didn't do it as much at wasp we kind of did um probably a three rep max rather than a, a one rep max but um yeah it's still it still is about it still is about yeah and then, and then going back onto the one rep maxes then i want to know some some of the heaviest lifts you've seen in the gym because some of those boys i remember seeing it because i went to loughborough briefly and i remember seeing some weights being lifted there that were just insane like i i thought that i thought they were bodybuilders and they go no no those are the rugby lads i'm like fucking hell like jeez you must have seen like what's the what's the biggest bench you've seen in the gym for for a rugby lad and who was it was it, a, was it what positions did they play? yeah there was a prop uh wasp called b allo uh he did 200 i think it was 200 kilos. maybe just over maybe 205 maybe something wow. um What's that like? And he's he's also I think he's like 125 kilos. So he's a he's a big man, he's a big human. Yeah. How tall was he? Six three, maybe. As a prop. Beast. So we, we, wow. Yeah, he he was tall. Uh, and like when we see him, we, we always say this. When we see him day to day at training, he just kind of obviously looks the same to us. But when we see him out in public, stood next to you know normal sized people. It's just ridiculous. He is massive. Was he doing all of them as well? Like, was he a, f- a huge squat, a huge deadlift? Was it? Did he just nail all of the key lifts? Yeah, he he was very strong. I think he was. So obviously, one hundred and twenty-five kilos. He was chinning with maybe fifty as well, 40, 50 kilos. Wow, wow. Added on top. Um, yes, yeah, so he he was he's very strong. I've seen there was a back that we've got here um, who was benching one sixty two the other day and there's a back you know that's that's pretty sure he's a big big guy as well but yeah 162 is heavy <laughs> very yeah. heavy so like eight plates or something like that it's a lot of plates yeah, a lot of plates a lot of plates yeah right i want to go back as well i want to go back in time and uh, imagine you're back at schoolboy rugby and your and your manager said to you you know we've got we've got a gap in the pitch but we need you to fill in mate what position would you least rather play on the pitch uh second row or front row any anything one to five i i would have absolutely hated and why and why is that mu- why is that is that because you got the, your heads up someone's ass when you're second row or is that you know is that just because you've got yeah. to get battered in the front row and basically you know get that- yeah exactly 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 that i would have hated to scrum i wouldn't mind going up in a liner i think that's quite fun um but yeah anything to do with the scrum i wouldn't be wouldn't be keen on at I've all. Got, I've got like a vision in my head now, mate, of you sitting there waiting for the pass to come out off the line out and going, oh, I'm a bit jealous. I wish I was up there in the air. <laughs> I, actually, I actually love watching line outs. I'll go, sometimes I do it in the gym in uh, like a 4G area and I'll just sit and watch it because they put so much time and effort into like the movements, how high they chuck them. Uh, I find it quite interesting how that we just, off this way to get the ball back in play, we put so much time and effort into it. It's quite quite a cool thing to watch as a as a geek of rugby. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to ask a couple of streetwear questions. Obviously, we're going to get fully into Composure Club later, so don't worry. We're gonna we're gonna get completely into that. <laughs> so, other than Composure Club, if you had to wear five clothes brands and only five for the rest of your life, what would they be? Uh, Jordan would be one. I wear a lot of basketball shorts. Um, and uh, yeah, very very good. Uh, Nike, I just feel like you know, the casual stuff. I'm pretty keen on um, Mizuno, just because I, I wear the boots. And actually, some of like the classic Mizuno stuff I've seen, like on Depop, some of the vintage stuff is quite cool. I haven't actually got any yet, but I, I'd love to get some stuff. Um, there's a brand in Australia called YKTR. If you guys have seen it, it's called You Know the Rules. Um, also run by a an, an ex professional rugby player. Oh, I didn't know that. Um, nice. Yeah, they they're quite big. They, their clothing is quite simple. Um, they've got quite loud colours, but the the print's quite simple. But they're quite hot on the content side of things. So they do a lot of podcasts, YouTube in, um, and uh, he sent me some stuff over a couple months ago. And I honestly, I wear it all the time. So that would be another one. Uh, and probably 
just to kind of stay in mainstream would be represent no, the, no. the stuff they put out. The stuff they put out is is unbelievable. I just got some stuff from the vault the other day. Um, it's, it's just such good quality and it just fits perfectly. Yeah, you've got some, haven't you, Jake? Oh, yeah, I kind of lost my represent virginity in the sale at Christmas. Just got a couple of bits, actually. I was like, it's, it's time for me to dip my toes in now, especially as you can get some... What did you think? Thought it was thought it was great yeah i didn't i bought some just kind of gym tops for like going out running and stuff like that so they're they're a bit tight but um that's the kind of look they're going for with those kind of like um spandexy kind of tops um but yes, i do yeah. want to delve into it a bit more because i know there's some real like cult following people that literally only only shop in represent mm. don't they they've got the youtube channel and i, I watch some of their stuff as well and like the following they've got is crazy yeah. Um, yeah what they've done is is unbelievable in terms of the kind of brand story i think that's really where represent have shined and you just mentioned like you watch their channel what what other content do you generally consume like day-to-day podcasts videos what kind of channels yeah i spend a lot of time on youtube mainly just around like kind of sneaker stores what the day-to-day is of a sneaker store there's a a shop in Arizona called Common Hype. I've been watching them for probably about a year or so now. I actually went over there uh, last year when we were in Arizona anyway, so I went to go see the shop. Um, just stuff like that, kind of the American side of content where they're putting out like sneaker stores, clothing stores, like going to the flea market, stuff like that. It's just, you don't see it as much in England. It's pretty cool. And I've probably spent a lot of my time watching that. You have uh, a section on Composure Club, which is devoted to sneakers, don't you? Yeah. 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 It's something I, I started purely me, not Paolo. Uh, he's not that much into, uh, doesn't really get into it, but um, we call it Composure Creps, where I kind of buy and sell shoes, try and source them for some of my mates and offered up on the page as well to try and find some for some other people. If you could only have three sneakers, for the rest of your life, what would they be? Any three, like I don't have to have them right now. No, any any three any in the world that you could have. Um, Sean Weatherspoon, the 97s, um, the corduroy ones with multicolors, they're unbelievable. Um, corduroy trainers, Jake, come wow. on, mate. I'm just Googling them now. <laughs> they're, they're very bright. Um, I actually have a pair. I got a pair a while ago, but they're they're so nice um my 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 favorite shoe of all time bread jordan four um i was big into jordans and i actually wore it yesterday to the game they're just an unbelievable shoe like completely timeless you could wear it with anything and the last one ooh, probably be uh michigan state dunks green and white yeah i absolutely love green the color green um so i feel like and you'll see i feel like you can wear dunks of anything similar to jordan fours yeah and when you if you rock up and you're rocking up to a game and you're wearing one of your favorite outfits and let's let's be honest right you, you like your clothes you like your shoes and and you know they're probably they're probably louder than some of the other people there right are you getting a bit of banter as you walk into the change room and they go and you know they're going, what are those? Or, or are you just wearing it? No, no, no. I, when it first started, uh, I think my first year I got into the into the first team, I kind of said to myself, every every game we've got, I'm going to try and wear like a pair of nice shoes, like a pair of Jordans, a pair of Dunks, something nice. Because everyone just turns up in like your Ultra Boosts or your Nike trainers you'd wear to training. And um, everyone was looking at me like, what What are you doing? Why are you? And I was like, oh, look good, feel good, play good type of thing. And then I noticed, like, as the years went on, more and more people would then wear, like, these, like, Jordans, these Dunks, Yeezys, and everyone would start to wear them a bit more. And it was, it was quite nice to see because you can see a bit of people's personality in their shoes when they're turning up to the game. Yeah, express a bit of personality. Yeah. And I think as what you said as well, look good, feel good. You know, sometimes in, in, like, a day, if you get up, even if you're just at home, if you just make yourself look a bit nicer, put on a T-shirt that you would prefer to wear rather than just your, your kind of gym clothes, you sometimes start work and you feel a little bit more kind of energised as opposed to just chucking on some, like, you know, dirty, unironed stuff. So I do get that. Yeah, and rugby's a game of confidence, yeah, right? So you've got, you've got to walk in there, you've got to feel great, you've got to be in the zone and you've got to be ready to play. So if, you, if you're walking in there confident, ready to go, it's going gonna, it's gonna to set you off well, isn't it? 
Absolutely, 100%. Who's the best player you've ever played with or against? <sighs> with or against? With um, Henry Slade. Yep. Plays, uh, plays, so I got my first England cap in about 18 months ago and I, he was at outside centre and I was inside centre. I'd never played inside centre. Well, I hadn't played it for a long time. Uh, I just got subbed in there because of an injury. Uh, and playing with him there was, was pretty cool. Obviously, I've seen him play for England countless times, played against him quite a few times as well. Uh, but to play with him was pretty cool. To play against, there is this uh, freak of a human being who plays for Leon. His name's he's a Fijian guy called Joshua Tuasova. If you, if you ever want to look him up, he is... A f- absolute freak of nature. Oh, wow. and I'm just looking now. <laughs> <laughs> he's he is ridiculous, and he's not from a skill level, but purely from like a fear factor. If he gets the ball, like I don't know where I'm going to try and tackle. He is someone I would probably the best player because he can touch a ball once or twice a game, but he'll score two tries from those touches. It is ridiculous. I'm just looking at him now, I, I reckon his thighs are bigger than my waist. <laughs> yeah he's but he's quite short as well so like when you try and tackle him you, you just don't know where you could hit him so was it was it when he was running at you you were just like i'm in trouble here oh it, it wasn't that when we played against him he they kicked it and i caught it and he was running at me yeah. so then i like caught it and he got the ball and me in one and picked me up ran me back five meters took the ball and I think they scored like two plays later and uh, I got subbed off <laughs> after that. Right, that's justified to hardest player then, just for, just from that story. Exactly, exactly. Did you feel some pressure to make it as a rugby player with the family that you have, right? Because you've, like, you've got a big rugby family, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, my dad played internationally, un- uncle played internationally, got cousins who played internationally. And uh, I kind of did and didn't feel the pressure because kind of it's just all I'd ever known growing up and it's just something you know you, I would I would wake up go play rugby and that's all I ever knew really um, and it's not until I kind of got older um, and I saw like I saw what it was about to other people that I kind of realized that this was a bit of a big deal um, but I always had in my back of my mind that I would be a rugby player I never kind of had any any backup plan whatsoever i just kind of thought it's it's gonna happen and i'm i'm, I'm glad it has because otherwise i could have been in a pretty sticky situation that was going to be my next question was there a backup plan were you studying do you find that lots of people that are trying to make it as professionals are also studying as well in the you know especially when you're going through the academies and your teens you know the chances are you probably won't make it i guess it's one or two percent right that make it yeah, and a, a lot of the lads uh, now, especially, do uni uh, uh, alongside uh, playing and training. So there's a lot of online courses people can do, and there's quite a lot of part-time players as well. Um, I, I never really, I wasn't the best at school. I kind of just scoped through kind of normal. And I, if I wasn't to be a rugby player, I'd have probably tried in another sport. I'd have tried to be like a semi-pro footballer or basketball or something because it's it's what I was good at sport was all I was kind of good at really um and I am glad that rugby came through are you aware of like people's family and their background like when you're playing with them like are there lots of other kids in the academies that they're like yeah my dad also played international rugby does is that common or- uh, it's, a, it's a mixed bag as over in England in New Zealand I did a year over there and that was quite eye-opening because you'd be playing kind of, you know, club low-level rugby against uh, an all-blacks brother or a first cousin or his dad had played. And it's just the norm over there because it's such a small place. You, Everyone, someone knows someone in their family who's probably played internationally or, or professionally. So once I'd kind of seen that side of it, then like when I went over there, I was just Jacob Mang and no one really cared about my, my uncle's status or my dad's status. It's just like, sweet, you're playing for us. So that made it kind of a little bit easier to understand. And what was it like? What was it like playing there as opposed to playing in the academy in, in the UK? Like, what were the what were the differences? That mainly like the way way it's played in New Zealand. It's a lot quicker. Uh, like they focus a lot more on the skills rather than trying to be the biggest the biggest team like in the gym. Uh, and it's something that suited me. Obviously, I'm a bit, bit of a smaller guy, so. 
a lot more time spent on passing the ball and running and keeping the ball in play was suited me a lot more. Nice. Coming back to like backup plans then and stuff like that. Obviously, you know, you've got your business, um, which seems to be doing great. Um, and we'll talk about that again towards the end of the podcast. But um, what's the kind of crack in terms of like rugby teams position on people having businesses or other sources of income alongside their rugby and like how that could possibly jeopardize how much attention they're paying to their to their rugby? Uh, they, they push it quite hard, to be fair. And we had a uh, we had quite a few boys in um, at Wasps who had there was a uh, two of the lads that had a drink like a what's it? a hard seltzer business drinks, basically like alcoholic drinks. Uh, and they, they pushed a lot of people to, um, to do other stuff outside of rugby purely because it isn't, it is, it's, it's well paid, but it's also not very long lasting. So it, it's going to be over quite quickly. Uh, so they want you to be, to be set up, um, for life after rugby as soon as possible. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense because what probably a rugby career is what, 10, 15 years, if you're lucky. If you're, if you're lucky, yeah, 15, if you're lucky. Yeah, and so so is there that, that kind of incentive to, yeah, as I said, either set up a business or, or save all your money, maybe? Yeah, saving, uh, they, they put a big emphasis on that. I think a lot of lads try to get into property um, and, and try and buy um small houses, rent them out, try and get another source of income. My parents have been pretty helpful on that. Um, my dad works at a university, so he's obviously pushing me to make sure that I know what I'm doing after rugby and said, so anytime you need any help uh, to try and help, I can, you can help me out with that sort of stuff. Because, you, you know, say you retired at 35 or, you know, God forbid someone got an injury, whatever, your, your career can be cut, right? And then suddenly you're like, well, I've got you know, before I technically retire at retirement age, I've still got 30, 30 odd years, right. To, to keep myself, you know, funded, which must be, yeah, quite scary for some people if they don't have a plan in motion. Yeah. Uh, I've seen quite a few people have quite uh, career ending injuries, like whilst I was at Wasp. So, and seeing that kind of firsthand and seeing how they've struggled like the, for the first few months is kind of hit home that we need to make sure we sort out what we're doing after rugby and, and like you say say you get lucky and finish at 35 you've got so much more time you then you're into the real world like if you if you don't get lucky and you've got to do it at 29 30 then it's even like it's it's something you have to be prepared for because it's going to come around pretty quickly definitely, definitely. so you've got composure club on the go do you have any other projects the in flight at the minute no nah, composure club's uh, the main one at the moment it's kind of something i'm trying to focus purely on for after rugby uh, i think i'd love to have that as my my main job uh once rugby's done um my girlfriend's mum's partner's an accountant so he's been helping me with nice like best things to do to save all the stuff going forward as well so it's it's quite helpful having those people around the next question i have for you is You've obviously had a, a pretty big move recently. You know, when you left Wasps, what happened and how did it then go into you moving to Italy? It was uh, a whirlwind of probably six weeks, really. Um, because we found out, obviously, club had gone into administration. Uh, we were all losing our jobs. And I was, I was straight on the phone to my agent, like, you know, can you find me something out there? But at the time it happened, there was no no spots anywhere any all the teams have been filled up for a fly half um so we just kind of had to sit and wait uh, and the offer from benetton came and within a week i was in italy playing at training um i was staying in a hotel for like the first few days uh, my girlfriend came over and was sorting out a flat uh, and within a week of being actually in italy we moved into a flat um and then we had to get a truck of our stuff to come over because you can only take two suitcases. Um, it was just absolutely crazy. And it's probably only in the last few weeks, probably since Christmas, we've just realized what has actually happened that we are now in Italy for the, like the next 18 months. And this is like, this is our life now. Cause it was, you know, the honeymoon period is kind of worn off of traveling around and seeing this and like seeing these the nice sides of Italy. But now it's our oh, right. This is this is it now, and I got to, you know, strap in and get used to it. Do they do the club help you? Because like I can imagine, um, you have play, uh, player liaison officers and that sort of thing to help you get set with them. But even so, like having a week 
to sort of, you know, find a place, try and move in, try and find a nice place in a week. I mean, it must have been like uh, with all the stress that you were dealing with in terms of actually playing, let alone then also sort of figuring your life out, figuring, you know, if your girlfriend wants to join you there as well. I mean, it must be super tough from like a million different angles. Yeah. And it's kind of sums it up. The week I got here, the, the team manager was on holiday. So everyone had been telling me, he's the guy you want to speak to. He'll help you find a place, a car, uh, sort your flights. And I was like, oh, sweet. Turned up on the first day. I was like, oh, where's, where is he? He's like, oh, he's on holiday this week. Um, no one told me whatsoever. So like that just kind of summed up the whole experience of it being so quick. And, and then that kind of took the fork in the road. But it, it, it is what it is. And we kind of just had to roll with it. And my girlfriend's been like unbelievable. She was sorting all the stuff out back at home and we've got a dog as well. So to get the dog over here, it's, it's just been a crazy few well, weeks. Well, foreign speaking country as well. How's your Italian coming along? <laughs> it's, <laughs> that, uh, that reaction gives you, a, give you all, it's, it's a tough language to learn. Um, and we, we do get lessons at the club, which is quite good. Um, but the kind of, the, the stuff you learn, I ask the lads the next day, oh, yeah, I've learned this, they're like, no, 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 don't say that, say this. And then there's so many different ways to say things uh, here in Italy. There's like one word can mean four different things. So when you're trying to pick that up, it's pretty difficult. I can just about understand like team meetings now, if we, what we're talking about, I can, I've got a few keywords I can understand, but apart from that, it's conversationally, it's, it's not the best. Can I ask, is, is training in English and are kind of tactical lessons in English or what's, what's the crack? Nah, all in Italian. Um, yeah. Do you have a so, translator there? Yeah. So the head coach speaks uh, Italian and English very well. So he, he'll do his speech in Italian for the 80% of Italian players and the 20% of us, he'll then translate into English. But it's like the the, the, the small talk is, is the hardest part when we're trying to communicate on the pitch and I'm trying to think of what it is in English and then speak to it in Italian. And then I've got to look if it's an Italian or an English speaker next to me. It's just a brain yeah. fart. <laughs> it's hard, mate. It's really hard. How's your Italian, Jake? We we had an Italian, mm. mate, we had an Italian holiday in October. Oh, yes, yes, yeah, we, yeah, we had a beautiful Italy. Italian trip and uh, Jake was best man at the wedding that we were at. And so I was very much leaning on him for his Italian. I just speak it Spanish amazing. to them and hope that they, I'm not bad at Spanish, so I just speak Spanish to them and hope that they understand. But then as soon as they reply, no idea what they're saying. <laughs> nah. <laughs> one thing, the one thing I worry about you though, mate, because I experienced this when I was in Italy. I just wanted to eat every single bit of food imaginable. How the fuck do you keep on the diet when you're in the, when you're over there? Because it can't be easy. I mean, when you've got the best pizza in the entire world on your on your doorstep, you must just be craving that. Yeah, the first two weeks we ate out every night uh, because it was just like we might as well just see what's around here. But once uh, the main thing is, we just tried to stay in the house in the evenings. We like we don't want to go out. We don't want to eat because the the food is unbelievable like it's the pasta the pizza the, the wine as well it's so nice i'm just trying to stay in as much as i can was that two weeks uh did, did you put on some weight on those two weeks because I, I we were there for about six yeah. days and i think i put on about a stone <laughs> yeah i put on a few i could definitely feel it in training <laughs> Like I was running around and I was feeling heavy. I, li- I don't envy you because I, it's like trying to stay on a diet over there. I don't think I would no be chance. physically able to do it. I would just be eating knocky every yeah, night and just feeling about... Stodgy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Stodgy is exactly the word. Yeah, the props are loving it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and the, the, the food we get at the club is just so attached. It's just pasta, tomato sauce and parmesan like on top. That's literally it with a bit of meat. The, the, and the boys the just strength, love it. They the absolutely love it. Strength and conditioning coaches are fucking tearing yeah. their hair out. <laughs> yeah, I, I think they're used to it now. So they're just like, you know what? That's all we it's could the cardio do. Cardio coaches, <laughs> <laughs> if they even have them. <laughs> yeah, they. Well, yeah. God, in Italy, what's the point? <laughs> You're not getting. You, you know, you, you're car bloating every night, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> so, what's been your highlight of your career so far? Uh, playing in the final uh, three. Four years ago, or three years ago now, that was a pretty pretty special moment. 
and and why why playing in the final over like your England cap or something like that? Because that surely was must have been an amazing moment as well, right? Playing for England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was it was pretty cool. Um, obviously, I played England eighteens, twenties, and then to play uh, for the first team was again like, it was a massive achievement. Um, but there's, there was just something special about what happened uh, with Wasps at the time to get from uh, we were kind of having a relegation chat at the start of that season to then playing in a final at the end of the season, it was just kind of crazy. And I think the year I had then, I, I was playing quite well. Um, so, and it just kind of felt like everything had reached the, the pinnacle for me at that point, playing in that game. Um, but don't get me wrong, playing for, for England was, was pretty cool. Uh, it's a pretty cool experience to play at Twickenham. Uh, and uh, having my family there as well was a, a cool a cool thing. And, you know, seeing my shirt lined up next to my uncle's New Zealand one and my dad's Samoa one is... It's pretty nice to have. And and how does that feel? Like, do you like because you grew up in England totally, but obviously your your dad plays for somewhere as you say, and and your uncle played for for the, for the All Blacks. How does how does that feel like representing England over over playing for another country? Like, could you could you have played for Samoa? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was eligible for Samoa and New Zealand. I've got New Zealand passport, um, but it's just. Someone said it to me, it's like your name's now traveling across the world to England and it's now seen the Umanga name is now playing, it's played in England, played for England. So when you put it like that, it, it's pretty cool. Uh, I think when I was younger, I really wanted to play for New Zealand uh, or Samoa, just, you know, to kind of follow in my dad's footsteps. But once once it happened, I think I was, I was quite nervous of it because I was like, oh, is it the right thing to do? Like, I want to play for this team, I want to play for that team. But you got to take what's in front of you, and and to see that shirt hung up, like I said, next to my 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 dad's and my uncle's is something you can't really replace. One hundred percent not. So you've had going from those really high moments, right? That, that I mean, unbelievable. I, I I can't even imagine it to be honest with you. It must have been super amazing. What going then back onto sort of like injuries, right? Going into like a, a sort of a moment where it's the complete opposite of that, where your sort of your world is turned upside down overnight you know, you don't know where you're going. You had a really serious injury, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, it's it pretty serious. Uh, I was kind of, I think it was a grade three uh, MCL, which is like your inside of your knee. Um, it's one, I think it was one l- level off getting surgery. So I was quite lucky I didn't have to get surgery. Um, but yeah, I did that in pre-season. Um, I think I was out for about three months, which is isn't too bad for rugby you know, considering the sport we play, but it was definitely a frustrating time. How did it happen? Like, was it, was it just a freak thing in, in training? Yeah, it, just in training. I think I was facing, facing this way and someone just landed on the outside of my knee and just kind of pushed it inwards. Um, so like the ligament just kind of tore on the inside and they were, they were doing a test on my leg and they were like, held my, held my knee and were like pulling it across. And usually like your knee stops, the foot stops there, but then mine just kind of like, kept going so like oh yeah yeah you've definitely done your you've definitely done your mcl ligaments like, oh right sweet so when you when you're sat there and you're on the table and you're getting that piece of info obviously you're a super young guy but are you sort of thinking like oh, i don't know what's going to happen how am i going to come back like am i going to be the same like are all these things sort of like wearing wearing through your brain as as it sort of happens yeah yeah definitely mainly just kind of the the confidence thing because a lot of you, you you want to be confident running into a tackle. And I, my, my first thought is, is my knee going to be all right? You're like, am I going to be fine going into contact? Like, uh, but it's just kind of something you get used to over time. And, and there's lads that have, you know, had way, way, way worse injuries than mine. And, you know, they've come back. One of the lads uh, here, um, one of the foreign lads, the New Zealand lad, dislocated his knee the other week. Kind of similar, similar injury to if you were in a car crash. And I, it happened right next to me, and it was the the worst thing I've ever seen. But he's he's just like, yep, yeah, it's just part of the part of the game, and then he's just going to try and work back to get fit again. It's just it's just crazy. At this time, did you start thinking about Composure Club a bit more, or other other options? Did that start to go through your head? Yeah, uh, at any time I kind of had a knock or a setback, I kind of threw myself into off field stuff. So as if to say I. I had a head knock. I was out for two weeks. I'd throw that into like, getting my diet right, getting my sleep right. And it was the same when I did my knee. I was like, well, I can focus on composure club and, and try and do a bit more there because we, I probably wasn't putting a lot of time into it just because it's like a hobby. But throughout those three months, I kind of felt I 
I put a bit more time into it. How did you get through that time sort of like mentally? Was it a case of, yeah, just get into Composure Club, keep busy, like keep your mind off rugby almost when you're sort of rehabbing? Because it must be, it must be really hard to deal with, to be fair. Yeah, it's the days are long. So you know, you'd come in at seven thirty. You wouldn't be done till three, and you're just in the gym that whole time. Uh, I, was, I was quite lucky that the the rehab physios I had were really, really good guys, and they kept your kept your morale pretty high. And also, I haven't like coming home, my girlfriend would look after me, so I'd just be there on like crutches, hobbling around, and she'd do everything for me, which made things a lot easier. But it. it once you get into kind of like the middle part of it, so the three months, once you get to like the six week point, you're like, I've just done this for six weeks. I can't see it getting any better. That's when it really starts to play on your mind. And, and some lads have been doing it for nine months, 12 months. And I, I just don't know how they get through it, you know, but I, I, I was all right. I had a good group around me to help me through it. And then you've, you've got like the three months of like, like recovery and, <laughs> and then you're back. When you're back, are you, uh, uh, is it almost, even harder because then you'd like right now I've got to get match fit and that's very different from being like physically fit isn't it absolutely the first week of training I was I was blowing out my ass and I, I kind of I kind of pride myself on my fitness um like in training and in games but even then I was like I don't know how I can keep up with this um and like we obviously wasps happened two weeks after I came back fit so then I had another six weeks off. So my match fitness just went completely. Um, but uh, yeah, it, match fitness is, is one of the hardest things to kind of replicate in training, uh, especially when you've been out for, for quite a while. Yeah, as well. you could do all the running in the world and you could be on those um, sort of like gravity treadmills and you could be doing pull work and you could be doing everything like that. But you're, it, regardless, you're not going to be able to... Someone comes and goes back. Yeah, you're not going to be ready to go, are you? So yeah, it must be. Nah, just the, 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 the amount of down ups you have to do, like the constant moving, like your legs just fill up straight away. It's it's not a nice thing. Was it feeling. your kicking leg as well or was it your standing leg? It was my standing leg, which was which was quite I don't know if it's lucky or unlucky in the same way because you know, I'm putting a lot of force through it, but also like it didn't affect my kicking, so I'm not too sure. And and now do you feel completely fine with it or is it something that it still sometimes feels niggle or is it just back to normal now? Cause that's, that's the thing. Like, you know, sometimes when I have an injury, it's, it's sort of like three months down the line, I've recovered and you're sort of like, Oh, it's cause we're old. Doesn't mate. feel right. Yeah. We're a lot older than Jacob. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, to be fair, once we'd uh, gone like, into administration, we weren't allowed to see the physios really. And because I was fit, I, I'd usually get my knee strapped before every running session, training session. We weren't getting that done. So I kind of just had to get through it. I kind of had to learn just how to run without the strapping. I have to worry about those types of things. But the longer I've gone on now, so it's probably been like, what, three months since that, my other knee has started to get sore just from like all the loading that it's been taken from like from the other one. Like I have to keep on top of my other knee more than my the knee that got injured. So weird, weird. yeah. Because I suppose with all yeah. the physio, Very it well gets strange. really, really strong. You would expect yeah. after all that physio, you got to make yeah. sure it's balanced. I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, but... you got to make sure it's balanced. I suppose when you're doing physio, so mm. you don't have one massive leg and then one really that's interesting. <laughs> or two small ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm not going to start having conversations about the size of my legs on this podcast. <laughs> no, definitely not. <laughs> No, no, no. If we put both of our, I think if we put all four of our legs together, they'd probably still play, be players. On, yeah, they on, might be as big as, team. big as Jacob's. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, Jake and I have been talking quite extensively uh, about sort of like injuries in, in sport recently. And we've been looking at sort of like football. And obviously there's a, there's a big bit of legislation that's coming through at the moment about heading in football. Um, and and that's must be regulated. I think it's in Scotland now. Um, kids can't head the ball unless it's in a game. Yeah, it's like ten headers a week where the ball has travelled over like forty yards or something like that yeah. maximum. Yeah, and you've said you've had. Uh, I, I presume you've had loads of head injuries. You're off for at least two weeks. You just mentioned, right? So you've had a few head injuries before, haven't you? Yeah, I've had uh, six or seven concussions in seven years of. So it's basically one a year. I've had one concussion a year. And I think three of those I've been like asleep, like out. It's not good, is it's it? Not yeah. good. So so when you're talking about that, like first of all, 
do you worry about that as a like just in yourself Long-term. yeah just for your for your own personal perspective yeah 100 percent. I, I, i've said to my girlfriend quite a few times if i have to retire i feel like it'll be through head knocks just the the amount that i get and how frequently i was getting them what would be the number for you, you what, to a point yeah, where you such that you went right, right i'm retiring or is there a number or you just would decide in if that was that there, there, there's not really like a not really like a number you get it's kind of you could have one and just have really really bad constant symptoms from them but i think i I've, if i've said i've had seven i think once it gets any closer to 10 i think i would probably start definitely thinking about it and if i was starting to get like symptoms whilst i was just like day to day then that's when it's time to call it a day what are the symptoms as well you get a lot of you know, headaches uh memory loss um got un- unstable uh one of my coaches had to retire through head knocks and he had he had points as he was coming to the end of his career where he just couldn't remember his wife's name jeez oh, he was getting knocked he was getting knocked out like every every session almost even just like even just like he tackle with his shoulder just the impact would just spark it and he'd be he'd be concussion really? so that that shit that stuff does, does your, work does your kind lot. of susceptibility to being concussed increase the more you've been concussed um i'm not too sure to be fair uh I, I'm, a lot of mine have been like freak accidents either like in the air and someone's taken my legs out or um i've run into someone whilst they're in the air and i've hit their hip but I think the, for the my girlfriend was saying she's a doctor. She was saying the more that the the forwards will probably have more in their more of an unsuspecting concussion just from the amount of constant impacts they're having, and they'll build up over time. Whereas if you're kind of asleep like I was, it's kind of better for you because you get like a factory reset almost. You give yourself time to know that you're out. Got it. And are there any kind of um, I just mentioned about football a minute ago and these kind of rules? Is there any like not legislation, but any yeah, I suppose rules starting to come in to try and avoid this for rugby players in training? Uh, not in training. Um, they've they've prolonged the return to play. It used to be a week you could play like a Saturday to a Saturday, but now you have to wait twelve days. I thought kind of seven seven days was kind of crazy to be able to to play again. They've tried to. They've been red carding a lot more like contacts to the head in, in games um, to hope that people bring their height down in their tackles. Um, but there's still every, probably every game there's, or every two games there's at least a red card for some sort of head contact. But they've also developed um, mouth guards, which detect how much um, contact you're doing and like the levels towards your head. So we use that in training and in games. And hopefully that will just help create some data around That's it. That's cool. Are they like linked up to like a wireless device or something? Or is it based on the amount of pressure that you've bitten down with? Uh, I think it's the, the the pressure you buy down with. I'm not too sure. But I think that what we kind of they keep them all in a box. I think once you've done the session and they, they track how many impacts you've had, how hard your force was, you're buying down. Well, that's amazing too. Is there... You, so first question is, is there anything else coming like in the future, do you think? Like, have you heard any rumors of rule changes or anything like that? Like, is there is there going to be anything else coming? I'm not too sure. Um, I, I kind of heard something, even trying to lower the ha- tackle height even more because I think it's it's around here at the moment. They're probably trying to want to bring it even further down. Um, but no, nah, apart from that, I haven't really heard anything. Would you, would you personally, if you were in charge and you were setting the rules, like, would you implement anything to the game itself? It's difficult because it's you want to kind of keep the game how it is. And it, it bad example, but if you watch rugby league, it's very open. But and the way they tackle it is how rugby union used to be. It's very like high impact, close to the head, and they don't sanction it as much as we do um but i think there's there's like a rugby union's probably in the middle space at the moment between like rugby league being you know you can kind of do whatever you want and get away with it and they're just just below it where they're like we are starting to put some 
like sanctions in place. But I, I, I personally, I don't think I could do anything. To it's it. super hard to do it, especially in rugby, because it is a contact sport, and and the <laughs> rules. Uh, I don't know how much you can physically do. And like people have said, like wear scrum caps or things like that. But you know, American football, they wear fucking helmets. And they're they're some of the worst uh, concussion and, and mm. brain injury problems in the, in the world. So I don't think you know wearing a scrum cap is the is the is the solution. But even even now in football, you know that they could quite conceivably in the near future just ban heading. And I think that could that could easily come in. And that then the sport is going to be a very different sport if that's the case. I think. Yeah. Like, yeah. To be fair, what I've heard is if Arsene Wenger had his way, he would he would ban heading. Really? Yeah, they would completely outlaw it. Probably didn't do heading in training for Arsenal when he used to play anyway. Yeah. So he was like, we can dispense with that. He is biased. Yeah. He was to play the ball on the floor, doesn't he? Yeah. Mm, he mm. Probably. How do you reckon? How do you reckon like fans would react to that? I I don't know because it would. It's such a seismic change to the game. I think it would be completely different. But do you know what? Like it would. I, the ones that would be the most affected are the players. Like overnight, you've sacked off central defenders. Like you yeah. don't need Harry Maguire done. Harry yeah. Maguire's career is over. Like, yeah. I mean, it's going to yeah. be over already. <laughs> 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 but yeah, I think I think the players would really suffer because, quite frankly, you wouldn't need height; wouldn't be an issue anymore. You would just you just pick ten fast guys that can pass the ball yeah. really quickly, yeah. wouldn't you? Yeah, like. you'd have you'd have a lot more Martinez's in defence. Yeah, how would corners work? Mm. Uh, they just won't you go just have to play height. it on the floor. You just yeah. have to play it on the floor. You could still probably play the ball above head height. You just yeah. can't head it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can do long balls. Yeah, yeah. That, that's absolutely yeah. fine. You just, yeah, yeah. You just can't head the ball. Interesting. Like they're they're talking now even about uh, changing the throw-ins, where so it's kicking. Really? Yeah, and that would ch- like just that would change the game completely. Interesting. I didn't. I didn't realize football was that hot on on this type of thing. Do you, to be do fair. you know what? I think it's like I said. I think it's the Wengers of this world that are out there at the top level, and they're trying to implement some like significant change. I don't. I don't really know. I mean, mm. like like you say, they've seen the data, and unfortunately, the data is pretty damning on the head injuries. So if they can get rid of the mm. heading ball, yeah, I think they really just want to stop a central defender maybe in a training session dealing with fifty goal kicks. You know, to keep. I remember when I was a kid, yeah. when somebody used to header a ball from a goal kick. You'd yeah. be like, Phew, afterwards, wouldn't you? you yeah, know, they probably just want to eliminate centre backs doing that fifty times a day in training. Yeah, but you're playing, you're playing, you know, fifty, sixty games a season, aren't you? Yeah. So, so even if you ban it from training, you've still got it's true. serious impact in. Yeah, very, very true. So now we're going to get on to the fun stuff, mate. We're getting into Composure Club. That's what we've been most excited. We've left it till last because it's actually the, it's the best bit. Right. <laughs> so, uh, so, so people that don't know about the brand, can you just give like a very quick summary of uh, of what you're doing and, and what you sell? Yeah, so Composure Club's kind of unisex streetwear. Uh, from t-shirts, hoodies, uh, to like shorts, beanies, trackies. We're going to try and bring some out. Uh, and we kind of built it on trying to express ourselves in a, an unexpressive world almost. And why, why is it unexpressive? <laughs> it- in, the, in the kind of the rugby world, it's kind of very, you know, you st- stick to what you go that you stay in your lane. So we, we wanted to kind of bring that out in, our clothing so we can show to other people that you know more than just rugby players is other size to yeah. people we're, we're fascinated by the unisex element of this because there's not many people that have the confidence especially as blokes i think that have the confidence to go uh i can design something that is, is looks as amazing on a bloke as it does on a on a woman so why did you why did you get into the unisex size like why didn't you just go for for Blake's clothes. So we, my girlfriend wears a lot of oversized stuff. And then when we were going through it, she was just like, just get some girls in photos. Cause it's, it's a whole nother market of, of people that you, you can get into. Uh, and I think a lot of people I know, a lot of girls I know wear oversized stuff. Um, so it kind of just felt like an extra 30, 40% of people we could tap into. And, and to be fair, in our, in the majority of ourselves, like it's, it's quite an even split. We do get a fair few girls buying stuff nice. as well. And talk to us about the designs as well. And the logo is a kind of playful couple of characters at the top as well of the page. Yeah. So that was, uh, Paolo does all our designs. Uh, and I don't know, it's just something we came up with one day and we, we just use it. And it's kind of something different that we, we hadn't really seen before. And it was, 
because we obviously he he dyes his hair quite often i dyed my hair so we just everything changed which was quite cool we thought um like even like even this here we got like a a mat of our <laughs> our heads i love that <laughs> i saw um, yeah because i saw a version of the logo that where you were bleach blondes but you know that it, does it just change over time so every time you get a haircut you have to change the logo <laughs> Pretty much, Paolo's, we've had to change it so many times. I've had blonde, pink, uh, and obviously dark hair. He's had pink hair, blue hair, red hair. Um, and it, he did it for a piece of artwork for me and him, just like we'd hang up in our, like in our house, in, a, in an office somewhere. And then we just kind of brought it into like, into our page, into our, um, like on our link tree with our Spotify, with our podcast. We just kind of used it as another logo. And it's no one's criticised it, so we kind of kept doing it. I love it. I think it. I think it looks really cute. I think it looks really nice. I really like it. Yeah, you've got your other logo as well, oh, your yeah. CC logo. Which, yeah, talk to us about that one. Just this is going to sound, <laughs> out, but Paolo just loves drawing circles. He loves just drawing circles. So he just used the uh, the C's, obviously, as the eyes, and we just kind of wanted to just use a head like a, a circle to try and make a face from it uh, and the original logo was um was like a diamond shape um but, but we i think Pav did a, a design just like a one-off design and, and they used like the cc as a as a smiley face and we were like that's that's pretty cool it like looks looks sharp so we just kind of just used it and it kind of came from nowhere and then now um it's like our main logo yes love it logo making is um oh god it's um it's something we put a lot of effort into but really like it doesn't matter a great deal not not when you're first not when off. you're first it's, starting it's, off but you're like we have nah, to get this right and you'll awful. never get it right and also like yeah. what's getting it right i'm yeah. sure jacob i'm sure you were the same like what is like the final outcome here it's like true. when is it ever perfect like you said you've changed it about 20 times already just from the hairstyles exactly and um, we've just got one that we just go back to but i think the amount of times i've seen like a two c's and a smiley it's never going to look right to me because i've seen it so many times and it frustrates me that i've seen it so many times but to someone else in someone else's eyes the first time they see it they might absolutely love it so who, who does the, the designs then you said paolo is um he does all the design work is that right yeah so he he'll do so we'll come up with an idea he'll do the design and then we kind of talk about it and see um what we can do to like improve it or if we need to improve it and then kind of just go from there nice and what's your main role in the business then so paolo sounds like he's very much the design man yeah and then i'll just i just kind of do everything else the the the, the 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 emailing the like match speed manufacturers the desire like speaking to the printers um postage i used to do a lot of the postage just you know folding it up in my spare room posting it off taking it all to the post office stuff like that did you have to teach all of this yourself mate or do it like did you just pick it up as you went like were you just learning on the job Com- yeah completely just learn on on the go i didn't have a business background at all uh, i didn't know anything about how to to run a, a clothing brand but it was something i was pretty passionate about from quite a young age so i just thought i'll give it a go what's the what's the worst that could happen how does it work with composure creps then because uh, we're, there, there's another side of the business we've teased this earlier on in the in the show but um you've also got this other side of what you do so how, how does that work um so yeah just i like we, we spoke about on how i absolutely love shoes and I kind of cycled through a lot of shoes personally anyway. So I'd get a pair and probably realize that I don't like it, try and sell it, get some money. Um, and then we'll, I was just one day, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to take some of my savings, buy a load of shoes and try and just sell them off and try and get some, some money from it. And it, I, I don't probably do it anymore um, purely just because of being in Italy to trying to liaise with people in England it is difficult, but I think it's something that I've been trying to do again if shoes are still popular in a few years time. Yeah, you're going to have to learn a bit more Italian and find some Italian contacts. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> put, that, put that very basic Italian to work. <laughs> I'm not sure the team meeting Italian is going to be useful for, for finding a sneaker. But... Nah. Nah, nah, nah. But the, the, the shoe culture is different over here, actually. There isn't as many you know, sneaker heads. It's kind of more um, golden goose is, is big here. And a lot of people wear those shoes there. Uh, they're not really into like the street wear. It's more like a, a formal, smart, smart, casual type of wear. So I don't think like sneaker reselling would do too well. And um, 
how's the brand going at the minute like when did you when we when did you start selling as well um it's yeah it's going all right it's been we started in may 20 2021 um and we've obviously got like 18 months or so now but the, the difficult patch was probably this last few weeks obviously me moving to italy paolo's moved to france and just we we'd got all of our like stock for the year we already like lined up knew what we were doing and then obviously everything happened and we were like ah we can't do a photo shoot we struggled to do a photo shoot to set everything up to, to you know go through samples and printing everything um and we, we've kind of found a way around it but now still like trying to organize and photo shoots is, is proving quite difficult so where's all the stock is it still in the uk or yeah yeah so we my girlfriend owns a house which we lived at before and we just leaving it there um all boxed up and her brother is helping us run like the operation side he goes in get when we get an order uh takes it to the takes it to every post it it's it's, it's slowly getting there we're starting to get into a bit more of a process with it i've got a question about about paolo then because obviously you, like your best mates you play together um <clears throat> in england how does that work? Like when you, like everything happened, you, you probably, you probably knew you were going to be at different clubs, right? Like it, it would very unlikely that you'd stay at the same club. How did it work? Like, you know, he gets this offer from France, you get this offer from Italy, you know, you're running a business together, your best mates. Like how, how does that, how does that work? Like, how did that make you feel? It was difficult. Uh, well, like, cause we've been obviously together, together at the same club for about three, four years. And, it was it was it was tough to kind of like because he's a uh, very independent person, so he knew straight away like he was just gonna you know, wherever he could go, he was gonna go. Because um, for him, obviously, it's easy; he can just kind of do a design, send it off, and and it's all sweet. But we we had to have quite a few like chats about how we're going to try and run it, and what's the best way to do it. Um, being him being in Paris is or like easier because he probably can get a flight an hour flight back to the UK if we ever needed to, to sort something out, but it's, it's going to be testing for sure. And how is that also with like all of your other teammates and your, and your club mates like leaving them? Like, I think this is a side of sport that people don't really like see, like you've obviously, you build up all these relationships. You were there for a long time. You obviously have to say goodbye. I mean, this scenario is even worse because it's sort of like the whole world is sort of crumbling um how how was that what was that like like saying goodbye to everyone and then uh, did anyone follow you to italy or was it like literally you've stuck like you're on your own um so there was one lad who came here before i did like a week before i did who's actually italian anyway and i was reasonably close with him so it was easy to to know someone here um but it it was it was tough and like there was a lot of tears like over the kind of the week that happened. Um, Cause obviously I'd known some of these guys since I was like 16, 17 lived together. Um, you know, we, we see each other every single day. And now, you know, there's two of us that are playing in uh, Australia. There's one lad in France is obviously I'm in Italy and it's just all scattered from, from nothing really. And it, it only hit home recently kind of what happened. I think, no one's been able to digest it properly at all. Uh, I think some of that clubs you get so caught up in trying to find out what's next, but now everything like now the dust settled. Um, I, oh well, I, like I, I've been quite tearful recently, just like watching old highlights, reminiscing on on the times we had because those were like the you know the best moments of our careers because we all had dreams of you know coming through the academy to being 34, 35, finishing the club together, and you know when that's taken away from you so quickly and out of your control it's it's going to take a long time to get over yeah especially with the way it ended and it's so abrupt and you have to completely change your life i mean like you said just the process of even moving Absolutely. is stressful let alone leaving all of your friends and finding a new club and all of that stuff i mean it, i feel for you mate it must have been absolutely brutal it must have been brutal yeah yeah it wasn't it wasn't easy at but like all. you say you've just got to make the best of it haven't you you've got to you've got to move on and also like this is an experience in itself and you never know what's going to happen in the future like you might end up back with some of those boys and 
and and everything's rosy so yeah life never goes the way we expect it to does it no so 2023 then with composure club obviously once the dust all settles what's your what's your plans with it then to to keep growing it like how are you funding it at the minute as well yeah so we're, we're trying to trying to push quite hard this year because obviously we can't be as hands-on as we were so uh we we've had quite a few like team meetings basically a facetime just me and Pabs, um <laughs> just around like just around how we, how we can uh um you know really put a lot more effort in the this year to try and really capitalize more because we're starting to build quite a, a good following a kind of loyal following so we're just trying to play on that and try and get into more of the try and maybe try and do more content side of it because that's obviously you know half the battle these days do you do you like making content like TikToks and all that kind of stuff, because that is obviously one of the the best ways to grow at the minute without spending money directly. You'll spend a lot of time, but you won't spend money. Mm. Yeah, do you like making content? I don't personally. Uh, I, I I don't I don't like being on camera. Man, really, it's been great uh, today. But Paolo, <laughs> thank you. Uh, Paolo is pretty good at it, and my girlfriend is is pretty hot on the. She does our social media, so she's pretty hot on it as well. Um, but. We're trying to we're trying to get into that side of things. Um, we just need to kind of put a bit more time into it. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a necessary evil, isn't it, in this twenty um, first century? But also, you've got to love it because otherwise, you wouldn't do it. If you did, if you didn't love mm. doing it, that that's the hardest thing because people do see through content that doesn't have the passion behind it. So if you don't like what you create, it's, it's always like you're better off just not creating the content because people just see right through it. Yeah, but then you got to spend a load of money on Facebook ads. Because yeah. like, where are you going to get your tra- traffic from and your following otherwise? Yeah. Mm. Have you had to teach mm. yourself all of that side of it as well, mate? Like, do you do, you do the marketing or, um, yourself? To be honest, I haven't done a single ad. Um, not done a single... We, I don't know anything about that. My girlfriend does the social media, but we haven't used any like Insta ads, Facebook ads, Google ads, nothing. We've just kind of relied on like our own platforms because obviously me and Pab's I've got a fair few followers together and you know, the people we use in our photo shoots also have quite a few good followers as well. So we have just purely relied on that. It's a really good way to go, to be fair. We, um, yeah, when we first set up, we wasted quite a lot of money on Facebook ads and we've learned a lot in the 18 months that we've mm. been doing it now. So yeah, if you ever do move mm. to Facebook ads, feel free to reach out and we can give you some of the mistakes that we made early <laughs> on for sure. Yeah. Now that'd be good to talk through actually. It'd be good to talk through right i think i think we've got through pretty much everything haven't we beautiful mate thank you so much for coming on we really really appreciate it no worries thank you for having me i enjoyed that it's been an unbelievable conversation like like super super interesting there's so much of the of the sort of professional sport world that people don't get to see very often i think it's been amazing for you to sort of shed a bit of light on that so thanks for being so open from that perspective because i know sometimes you've got to be a little bit secretive of these things haven't you yeah, yeah, the media training does, you know, come out to play, but it's it's nice to kind of talk a bit more openly and a bit bit more free. Yeah, like no one's trying to trip you up. We just sort yeah, of we're just curious. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So before absolutely. you go, mate, can you um, let people know where to find you and then where to find uh, Composure Club, um, so they can start buying some of those amazing clays? See, yeah, uh, my answer is Jacob Umanga U M A G A, and then Composure dot Club. Uh, for the Instagram and composure-club.com uh, for our love website. It, love it. And don't forget, you've got a TikTok as well. So, you know, that's where all the kids are, mate. So we'll, we'll plug the TikTok as well. I need to, I, I actually couldn't even tell you what our handle is. Probably just I've got it. I've, I need to, I've got I it need for to. you. It's at, at Composure Club. <laughs> so, so there you go. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> mate, I've, I've loved it. Thank you so much for coming on. We'll definitely um, have a few more chats as well. Like this has been super, super interesting and, and best of luck growing the brand and, 2023 thank you very much thank you very much thanks for having me don't worry